Raptor 3, the latest rocket engine developed by SpaceX, is set to launch later this year. Despite its highly advanced design, the engine is not without its flaws. It still faces several technical challenges that need to be addressed. Today, we will explore the key issues the Raptor engine is currently facing and, more importantly, discuss the potential solutions being developed to overcome them. One of the ongoing challenges with the Raptor engine is its highly complex startup sequence. Raptor uses a full-flow stage combustion cycle, which involves two separate turbo pumps, one for liquid methane and one for liquid oxygen. Each turbo pump feeds propellant into its own pre-burner, where a small amount of fuel is ignited using torch igniters to produce hot, high-pressure gas that drives the turbines. Because of this complexity, startup failures are not uncommon. If a preburner fails to ignite or does not ignite precisely as intended, the system can reach a stoichiometric mixture, where fuel and oxidizer are in perfect proportion for maximum combustion energy. This is dangerous because it can lead to extreme temperatures, potentially overheating, melting, or even exploding the preburners. To mitigate this risk, the system should ideally include interlocks or gates that prevent the sequence from advancing unless there is positive confirmation that the igniters have functioned correctly. This would help avoid situations where unignited propellant accumulates in the engine. Despite its complexity, a startup is in some ways a more controlled process than a shutdown. It is essentially a carefully choreographed sequence of valve timings and settings, designed to ensure that fuel and oxidizer are introduced in the correct order and quantities. The goal is to guarantee ignition, or at least confirm that the igniter is active, before the main propellant valves are fully opened. What you really want to avoid at all costs is a loss of ignition event during engine operation. As mentioned earlier, ignition must be continuously maintained in three critical areas, the fuel side preburner, the oxidizer side preburner, and the main combustion chamber. A failure in any of these locations is a serious problem. This is especially critical when dealing with liquid oxygen, LOX, and methane, which are miscible and can form a highly sensitive explosive mixture. Losing ignition in any part of the system can allow unburned propellants to accumulate, creating an extremely hazardous condition. If ignition is lost, the priority is to stop adding energy to the system immediately. That means initiating an emergency shutdown as quickly as possible, regardless of the mission phase. In a modern, well-designed engine, such a situation would be detected by onboard systems, prompting rapid valve closures and a full shutdown to contain the risk. When SpaceX developed the Raptor 3 engine, one of their main goals was to eliminate many of the small, complex components that added mass, cost, and failure points. This included reducing the number of external pipes, wiring, and other intricate fittings by integrating more systems directly into the engine structure. Among the most significant components they aimed to remove were the engine shrouds. Eliminating the shrouds would result in a dramatic reduction in mass, simplify the design, and lower manufacturing costs. In Raptor 2, the shrouds remained necessary. Any part of the engine that is still vulnerable to extreme heat or high aerodynamic pressure, particularly during periods of high dynamic pressure known as Max-Q, requires protective shielding. Even though Raptor 2 was a major simplification compared to Raptor 1, it was not yet streamlined or robust enough to eliminate the need for shrouds entirely. Raptor 3 addresses this limitation. One of the key innovations enabling this improvement is its advanced regenerative cooling system. This method involves routing some or all of the cryogenic propellant through narrow channels embedded within the walls of the combustion chamber and nozzle before the propellant enters the injectors and is burned. Although the walls of the engine may appear thin from the outside, they contain internal channels that allow the propellant, typically the fuel, to absorb heat from the engine structure and keep it cool under extreme thermal loads. The inside of the nozzle wall becomes extremely hot, while the outside remains very cold due to the constant flow of chilled propellant. This cooling method enables engines like Raptor 3 to operate continuously under high thermal stress. While fuel is most commonly used for regenerative cooling, oxidizer can also be used depending on the engine's design. One of the challenges with regenerative cooling is that the pressure inside the cooling channels must be higher than the pressure inside the combustion chamber. This is because the channels directly feed the injectors, and since pressure naturally flows from high to low, the coolant must be at a higher pressure to reach the combustion chamber effectively. 
The removal of many bolted interfaces in the Raptor 3 design is a brilliant move from both an engineering and reliability standpoint. This change offers significant advantages in terms of weight, reliability, and system simplicity. Bolted joints require heavy flanges, seals, and bolts that must endure harsh conditions, including cryogenic liquids, extremely hot gases, and oxygen-rich hot gases. These conditions are notoriously difficult to seal, and every mechanical joint presents some risk of leakage. By replacing many of these connections with welded joints, SpaceX significantly reduces potential leak points and simplifies the engine's construction. Welded interfaces are lighter, more reliable, and improve the overall robustness of the system. Then, there is the problem of cavitation. The Raptor engine is specifically designed to use deeply subcooled cryogenic propellants, meaning liquids cooled close to their freezing points rather than just below their boiling points, as is more typical in traditional cryogenic engines. Subcooling increases the density of the propellant, allowing more mass to be stored in a given volume. This improves engine performance and increases specific impulse, while also helping to reduce the risk of cavitation in the turbo pumps. Cavitation occurs when local pressure drops low enough for vapor bubbles to form in the liquid. These bubbles may seem harmless, but when they collapse, they do so violently, causing pitting and erosion on metal surfaces. As Elon Musk has explained, it seems counterintuitive that bubbles could damage metal, but they can, and they do. If cavitation becomes too severe, the pump can start generating more vapor than usable flow. This leads to a significant pressure drop, which can starve the engine and potentially cause it to fail. Even small amounts of cavitation can cause long-term damage, and it can occur on both the oxidizer and fuel sides of the engine. To reduce the likelihood of cavitation, propellants must be kept as cold as possible, and inlet pressures must be kept high. Another important factor is the design of the inducer blades. The angle of the blades determines how much wake and turbulence are created in the fluid. Shallow angle blades disturb the flow less, which lowers the chance of forming vapor bubbles. Musk compares this to moving your hand through water. A shallow motion creates less wake, just as a shallow angle inducer creates a smoother flow and fewer cavitation sites. While this is a simplified analogy, it captures the essential concept. In the Raptor engine, the solution involves an inducer stage that cuts into the flow at a shallow angle, producing only a modest pressure increase. This is followed by the first impeller, which provides a much larger pressure rise. At first glance, the SpaceX Raptor engine might appear simple compared to other rocket engines, but that couldn't be further from the truth. Despite its compact design, Raptor 3 still faces all the challenges that come with building a high-performance engine. What makes it remarkable is that SpaceX has managed to address those challenges while maintaining a streamlined, efficient architecture. That is the true beauty of the Raptor 3. And there is no need to wonder when we will see it in action. SpaceX has confirmed that Raptor 3 is set to make its long-awaited debut with the Starship V3 prototypes, specifically Booster 18 B18 and Ship 39 S39. While more V3 pairs are expected in the months ahead, only one launch featuring B-18 and S-39 is scheduled before the end of the year. This single flight will be crucial, serving as SpaceX's first real opportunity to gather in-flight data on Raptor 3's performance, durability, and any remaining issues that may arise under operational conditions. Despite the challenges that remain, excitement around Raptor 3 has never been higher. It stands on the brink of becoming the most powerful, efficient, and advanced rocket engine currently in development. With its simplified design, reduced mass, increased thrust, and enhanced potential for reuse, Raptor 3 represents a major step forward, one that could address many of the technical hurdles that have previously limited Starship's progress. So, is it true that no other combustion engine is as efficient as the Raptor engine? Well, not necessarily. The benefits of the full-flow staged combustion cycle are indeed immense. In this cycle, almost all of the oxidizer is routed through the oxidizer-rich preburner and turbine, with only a minimal amount passing through the fuel-rich preburner. At the same time, nearly all of the fuel is run through the fuel-rich preburner and turbine, with just a small portion going through the oxidizer-rich side. As a result, both propellants enter the combustion chamber fully in gaseous form. This leads to better mixing of the gases prior to ignition, enabling faster and more complete combustion compared to engines that rely on liquid-liquid or liquid-gas mixing. The efficiency gain here is significant, particularly for high-thrust applications like Starship. However, another highly efficient cycle worth exploring is the expander cycle. 
The core idea behind it is to run the engine using its own waste heat. During thermal expansion, either the fuel or the oxidizer absorbs heat and the resulting energy is harnessed to drive the turbo pumps. In most designs, the fuel flows through cooling channels around the combustion chamber, picking up heat and transitioning to a gas. This high energy gas then powers the turbine, which drives the pumps for both the fuel and the oxidizer before being injected into the combustion chamber and ignited. Because this process depends on phase change and surface area, the expander cycle is inherently thrust limited due to the square cube law. As you scale up the nozzle size, the surface area for heat transfer increases with the square of the radius, but the volume of fuel requiring heating grows with the cube of the radius. This limits how much thrust you can generate in large engines. That said, there is a particularly exciting variation, the dual expander cycle. Much like how the full flow cycle separately handles the fuel and oxidizer sides, the dual expander uses two separate paths, one for fuel and one for oxidizer, to extract thermal energy. This eliminates the need for purges and reduces certain failure modes since the hot gases driving the turbines are of the same chemistry as their respective liquids. This is especially useful in systems like hydrogen and liquid oxygen, where the difference in fluid density is so significant that the optimal turbine speeds vary greatly. Traditionally, this required a complex and failure-prone gearbox to match the speeds of the fuel and oxidizer pumps. The dual expander approach removes the need for that gearbox by allowing separate turbines for each propellant. There are two main ways to implement the dual expander cycle. One method uses separate regenerative cooling loops. For example, the fuel cools the combustion chamber while the oxidizer cools the nozzle. The other method uses a single fluid, typically the fuel, to cool the entire engine, while a heat exchanger boils the oxidizer before it is sent to its own turbine and then into the combustion chamber. So, do you think this engine cycle has the potential to surpass the Raptor engine? Let me know in the comments.